Hey guys, we're glad that you're here with us today and welcome to the FBC Okeechobee podcast. Marie, are you glad to be here today? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> that was very, yes. It's very, you know, cut and dry. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not that excited about. You're not, you're not excited? I mean, just about, I'm tired today. I don't know. You're having a rough day? It has been a rough day. When I, I did come, we're, we're, we're filming this in the afternoon. And so when I did come home for lunch, there would there had been some, some consternation, I yeah. believe, with math. Yeah, yeah, there was. Some yeah, there had been with with Charlotte, <laughs> little Charlotte, mm -hmm. and her little math lesson. Yeah, it had been tough. So, well, I'm feeling pretty good. So here I am. Maybe I can carry the load for everybody today. You do that. You usually jump on board though and get with yeah. it. But today is a very interesting topic because we finally finished Mark chapter four, and we're now into Mark chapter. Five. There you go. That Mark, math lesson. <laughs> well, there, well, it was that math lesson. It got you reported to point B. So Mark chapter five. And the first part of Mark chapter five deals with demon possession, specifically the the story and is uh, probably the most um, well-known and descriptive story of demon possession in the Bible. And that's when Jesus encounters legion. And so it's uh, it's a controversial topic, you know, amongst amongst people because uh, people have different ideas about this. And I think one of the one of the difficult things I think this is where we need to really balance is we don't need to ignore demon possession, but we also don't want to overemphasize demon possession. Like okay. we, don't, I feel like we, you know, and this is something I've talked with kids about a lot over the years. We don't want to. Like harp on it and and let that be something we really spend a lot of time digging into, and we surely don't want to play with any of these kind of things and you know mess around like I'm anti Ouija, Ouija boards and say, all Ouija that boards? kind of stuff. Yeah. Anything that that can invite these types of issues and things, yeah. you know, I think we need to you know heartily avoid them. But it is in Scripture, and just as uh, the Bible talks about God. The Bible also talks about Satan. Just the Bible talks about angels. The Bible also talks about demons. Now we like the God and the angels part, but you know we we're more, um, I guess, hesitant sometimes. Certain groups of people are more hesitant sometimes to kind of deal with the fact that that there's real spiritual warfare. There's angels. There's demons. There's things that are happening around us that we don't you know see and understand. Yeah. So let's look at this passage and how this demon or demons really is. We'll go through it. Deal with Jesus is interesting. It said, So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. Now there's problem number one. <laughs> he was in a cemetery? Living in a cemetery. Of all the places that I could think to he live. Was li how do you know he was living there? Well, that's it. Is it, it will we will continue in verse three? Oh, okay. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. So there's an interesting thing to this: the way the Jews at this time did burial, like they didn't, you know, dig a hole, put the coffin in. They dug out like these caves, mm -hmm. and that's we the, the the garden tomb with Jesus. And what they would do, they would take and put the bodies after they had anointed them and did all of the ritual things they did. They would take and put the bodies in these caves and basically allow them to, you know, rot. And then they would put the bones in what was called an ossuary. And it was a bone box. And sometimes just one person went in the bone box. Sometimes they might have a whole family of bones in the bone box. I think we saw a um, history program that talked about um, Jacob or Joseph. James. James, okay. James, yes. It was a J. Yes, there was an ossuary found um, in the area of Jerusalem that, and if I remember the inscription right. Yes, James, it, the brother of Jesus. It yes, said. it said James, it said, the brother of Je James. Yahshua or something. It was James, the brother of Jesus, son of Joseph, mm -hmm. I think, or James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, yeah. one or the other. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which way it went. And there was a lot of debate. Is this like James James from the book of James? And then people went back and forth, you know, on the inscription. Was it real? Was it fake? Blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. Who knows? But it was a little box. And yeah, it, it was had a little box. Yeah, it. and they, it was big enough for the biggest human bones, and they just put all the bones in there. 
And so he was living amongst this cemetery with these burial caves and these things happening here. So it was it was a sketchy situation to say the least. And the other interesting thing in verse three is it says um, he was no longer able to be restrained even with a chain. So apparently he had some level of strength. excessive strength. Now that goes over into my favorite part of the book of Acts. This is my favorite thing that happens in the entire book of Acts, is the sons of Sceva. They were uh, exorcists, and Sceva apparently had been a Jewish priest. They were Jews. And the Jews during that time, during the time of the New Testament, around all around that Mediterranean area were known as being way better at exercising and dealing with demons than any other people. Uh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, they were, they, they were kind of known for that. And so these, these seven sons of Sceva mm-hmm. would go around and yeah. they would exercise these demons and then they would get money. Now, how much of it was charlatan stuff? I don't know. But this time they ran up on the wrong boy. And so they go into the house and they, u- they use the phrase, they said, um, in the name of Paul... Who preaches in the name preaches of in the name of Jesus? Jesus yeah. uh, we cast you out, and the demon looked at him and said, "I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know you." And then proceeded to tear the clothes off of him and throw him out of the house naked. I loved it. It's kind it's of crazy to think the, about the, uh, that. He, of course, we know that demons know Jesus, but yes. you know he. He knew Paul, Paul was on his radar, yeah, too. Yeah, he was like, I know Jesus, I know Paul. Yeah. yeah, I love that part when he says, I know these two, don't know you, and then just proceeds to, yeah. you know, whip them and throw them out of the house. Anyway, that's my favorite part of the whole book of Acts. I don't know what that says about me, but that's my favorite part. So there's multiple examples there in the Bible of these demons possessed people um, showing strength. Like, I don't care who you are. Whipping and tearing the clothes off of seven men at one time, like that's some impressive stuff, man. Like that mm-hmm. is wild. And so we see that. It says in verse 4, whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, so the town tried to deal with it. He snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. And when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. And with a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. So, he knows Jesus. This is also reminiscent of the sons of Sceva, where I know Jesus, I know Paul. Then when Paul is, um, is also dealing with something a little bit later in the book of Acts, he has this girl mm-hmm. that begins to follow them around. A fortune teller? <clears throat> yes. She was demon-possessed. And she was proclaiming that this, he, this, is the, this is a messenger from God. This is a messenger from God. And Paul wanted nothing to do with this and didn't want this woman proclaiming anything. And so he cast the demon out, and it caused a lot of stink in the town because they were using this girl and her demon-possessed situation to make money as a fortune teller. And so we see throughout Scripture, not only we see at times strength exhibited, we see that these demons, they give almost honor to Christ, honor to God. Like when the son, with the sons of Sceva says, I know Paul. I mean, what do I say? What do I say about Paul? I know mm-hmm. Jesus. So here, this one comes that when Jesus comes to him, he says, "Jesus, Son of the Most High God." I mean, he proclaims who Christ is. So he is in no form or fashion a follower of Christ, but here he does tell the truth about who Christ is. You know, I mean, it goes back to the the idea that we we see is that you know, and I believe I believe it is in the Book of James when this is talked about that. Um, even the demons believe. believe. Yeah. Yeah, even the demons believe. Satan believes. So it kind of go takes you back into that. So when confronted by Christ, this demon or demons immediately knows who he's dealing with and immediately is terrified. Because 
man may have no control over him, but he answers to God. Mm -hmm. And so there you go. That's like cut off right there. He shrieks. I mean, you even look in the book of Job in Job chapter 1. You remember Job chapter the most, to me, one of the most interesting chapters in all the Bible is in Job chapter 1. Where, where Satan asked permission from yes, God? Yes, yes. Satan actually, Satan actually appears before God in heaven and has a convo. And then that's when he, or God says, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, probably the hardest words, I don't know if Job knew all that was quite said and how he understood all of it. But well, it was a bad day for Job. Mm-hmm. And then Satan asked permission to do those things, you know, to to test him almost. But there's a difference between because it talks about how God does not tempt us. No, that he does is not. Not from him, but no. testing is different. Testing is different. You say? Yes, testing and tempting are different. Um, temptation is to tempt me to sin. You know, I mean, to to deal with a trial is to put my faith almost to put my faith to the test. And really the test is more for me than it is for God. Right. To show me that I can trust. You know, like when Abraham with Abraham and Isaac, God God tested Abraham and he told him he says go do this. And so he does and then at the end of the day God provides. And so what was revealed in that was Abraham's faith and God's provision, and that Abraham could trust God. And so when we go through trials, when we go through these things, they're always with that idea of building us, of making us better, and that's very different than temptation. Temptation is sin. Like, that's that's definitely set apart. So a trial and a temptation are two different things in Scripture. Yeah. So the demons tempt, Satan tempts, our own sin nature tempts. You know, I was talking about that last God, Sunday. God doesn't permit them to, like, he doesn't send any any demons out and say, go tempt these people. Is it a I don't believe, no, no, I don't believe so. I believe, like, God allows them to go about their work, so to speak, but I don't believe he commands them. Like, Satan asked, can I do this? And God said, I will allow you to go this far. But even then, he wasn't really... Th- that he wasn't was, really tempting. No, him, that no. was more of the testing trial, right. dropping out, you know, just the whole world fell in on Job to the point he was had sores all over him, you know. But he wasn't... He, it wasn't the same kind of thing. So tempting is, to me, a different, a different scenario than a trial or a test. Right. So as you keep looking through this, um, as soon as you get out of the boat, here this guy comes right at him, and he even asked him, why are you interfering with me? So this was the demon speaking. This was not the possessed man. The demon here did not want to leave the host, and it had to be dealt with. And so Jesus does deal with this. When we continue down and look at the next part in verses 9 through 13, then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, "My name is Legion, because there are many in uh, there are many of us inside this man." Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send him to some distant place. Now, this is a really interesting verse right here in verse ten. Um, all of nine and ten both are very interesting because we get a name of a demon. Right? We know Satan is Lucifer. Like we understand that because Satan itself just means adversary. Lucifer is like the actual name, you know, like we know Michael and Gabriel. Like, we don't know any other names of any other angels. Here, we get the name of uh, of at least this group of demons that called themselves Legion. And this played back on the Roman army. Were they literally more than one, but they were a group to, that stayed together? Or uh, do we know? I can't say if they if they always stayed together, but it does say that it is a group because there are many of us inside this man. So they refer to themselves collectively as Legion uh, from knowing that Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, knowing that all of them have names, I would suppose that all of those demons would have had individual names, just as the angels do. We just don't know them. I mean, you know, uh, there's a, I think, I want to say, is it Raphael? There's another name that um, has tried to be 
given to and uh, a, another angel, but it's extra biblical. It's not something oh, okay. that we really know. Like Lucifer, Michael, Gabriel, we got those. We got Legion down here. This is a group. These boys are all hanging out together, and it's a really bad scene. And then in verse 10 it says, Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. Now, this is in the New Living Translation, but when you go to like the New American Standard, um, King James, New King James, it talks about to not send them to the abyss. That's what I was going to ask. So it's not a place on earth that's far away. It's uh, to base, hell. Not hell. Uh, when you go forward into the book of Revelation, it talks about the, the pit of the abyss. And this is where there are certain demons that have been bound. Contained until c- c- yes, contained. they are released. And then they are released during the tribulation. Right. And uh, it appears that they basically possess, torture, just wreak havoc on the Antichrist's like world, like on all the people following him. And so when you dig into the actual Greek, um, I don't necessarily like how the New Living Translation translate this, translates this verse. I don't say that very often because I really like the New Living Translation. I feel like it, it, it does a really good job getting us to where we need to be from uh, Greek and Hebrew to English. But here I would disagree with them. And I think the idea of the abyss fits because it's a certain place. And it's also referenced over in the book of Revelation. Right. So I think what they were saying is don't bind us up in the pit of the abyss is basically what they're asking for. Uh, and then in verse 11, it says, There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Uh, and another thing to think about here is this was a Gentile area because the Jews would not have had oh, herds of pigs. Oh, that's true. They didn't pigs. eat Yes. No, we would pork. not have had that. So my Jewish friends do not know the joy of the bacon. They don't know what they're missing out on. They do not know what they're missing out on when it comes to the bacon. But you do you. Um, so Legion then says in verse 12, Send us into those pigs, the spirit spirits begged, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered into the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down a steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. So when they went into the pigs, the pigs went nuts. Off the hillside, That's we the got. part that's always confused me. Because why ask to go into the pigs if they're just going to commit pig suicide? Was it pig suicide or was it... <laughs> we'll call it pigicide. But is that what, it, what the demons caused themselves? Caused How? the pigs? Here's what a, a commentary that I was looking at talking specifically about that. It said this. It says the demons wanted to enter the pigs because demons are bent on destruction and they hate to be idle. So being in the pit of the abyss, they're idle. This is what this commentator said. And so they're bent on destruction. They destroyed this man's life. And now here they are. They're going to destroy these, these animals. They're bent on destruction. Satan is bent on destruction. But then what happened to them after that? I don't know. I guess they went and did something else. I have I have zero answer for it's, you. That's the part that's confusing to me. I understand. Because if they were just going to, let's say, after the pig suicide, they just went somewhere else, why couldn't they have just done that to begin with? But I guess if they wanted to destroy something. Well, you think about it. You know, it's, uh, you know Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. First Peter 5, 8, it talks about that he's like a roaring lion looking for who he will devour. And so Satan is bent on destruction. And so here we destroy some pigs. And it is fascinating. And I agree with you that it's like, it leaves me with some lingering unanswered kind of questions, but I, I, don't, I don't have the perfect answers for those. I wish yeah. I did. Now the end of this is, is interesting. Let's look at verses 14 through 17. We'll be done. We've covered some ground today. This is unlike us. Because I haven't talked as much. <laughs> Verse 14, the herdsmen uh, fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside. So the people that were in charge of this herd of pigs. Spreading the news as they ran, people rushed out to see what, was, what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw 
uh, the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed, perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. The crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. To leave who alone? To leave them alone. They begged for Jesus to go. Get out of here. Oh, okay. He freaked them out. Like when he did this and they were scared by the power and what which is weird because usually when you see god perform or christ perform a miracle of some sort it's to draw hearts closer it opens Mm -hmm. the door they accept and they want to know more but did it do the opposite in this case or i guess so yeah they 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 and i would probably say it was on a couple levels um and remember at this point these are jews not gent uh, these are gentiles not jews that he's dealing with so there's a little bit okay. of a difference there, probably. Was the man a, a Gentile or? Uh, probably so, yes. Yes. So when you put all the different pieces together, I think the pigs being killed, that was that was some cash money right there. That was a big deal. 2,000 pigs. Think about what that would have be- been worth. I thought they were wild. No, it was a herd of pigs, and oh. it says the herdsmen fled to the nearby town. You see, Yeah, two th- they, that would have been upsetting. Yeah, you see 2,000 pigs running around just... On their own in a big group. I didn't know. <laughs> that's that's the wild stuff. Like, guys, uh, they're gonna kill everybody. Like, it's yeah. wild pigs. So no, these appear to be like domesticated pigs. These were okay. these were like um, animals, like farm animal kind of situation. Okay. So we destroyed the money, mm-hmm. right? We have freaked everybody out because the crazy guy's now sitting there with his clothes on. Because they might be wondering too, naked. where did those demons go now? They might yeah, be where wondering did that go? That. You need to head out because we don't know what's happening. So it freaked them out. It just really freaked them out. They were just like, just go, get out of here, get out of here. You killed all our pigs. Yeah. This guy seems normal now. It's a whole thing, and so it was. It was crazy, but. Jesus does do anything about the purpose. In 18, 19, and 20, I think, give us a little key to that purpose, and we'll okay. end with these verses. Let me, let me it says, it. as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. I totally understand why. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, yep, assign me up. I'm with you now. Like I, I would be totally in. So, But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he's been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns. These were the towns in this surrounding area of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed at what he told them. So Christ did this. He healed this man. He saved this man from this possession. And then this man put his trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus says, nope, don't come with me. Because Jesus earthly ministry like that three and a half years was focused pretty much exclusively on the Jewish nation. Now immediately after that he tells the disciples, no, no, ends of the earth stuff guys and they wind up pretty quickly after that beginning to reach out to the Gentiles um, around Judea and surrounded Judea. So here Jesus is sending out an early, just like Gentile missionary yeah, and it goes back to, I think, a previous uh, podcast where we talked about the will of God is to spread the gospel. Mm-hmm. And we see that again in this. Yeah, and this, this guy's instance. doing that. This guy, mm-hmm. and he follows through. He says, nope, go tell your family, tell them everything the Lord has done for you, how merciful he's been. He even goes past the family and goes to all, goes to these 10 towns and is telling everybody about Jesus. And you can understand why. This guy's, yeah. got, this guy's got things to say, man. Mm-hmm. He's got stuff to do. And so when I look at it, I see fruit from that. Like how many people um, listened about this? You know, it says they were amazed at what he had told them. So how many of these people even later on as the book of Acts itself plays out and the gospel begins to spread, how many of these people that this guy talked to connected the dots and yeah, later became Christians? Cool. So there was a... Yeah, there was definitely an evangelistic part to this. He saved this man, which was enough, but not only that, he spread his own, He spread the word. And remember, this brings glory to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is about, all about bringing glory to himself because he deserves it. Yeah. When Jesus, when glory is brought to Jesus, good things happen. So, and that's what this guy did. He wasn't talking about himself, he's talking about Jesus. So, what do you think? I like it. Very good. Guys, we're glad that you've been able to be a part of our podcast today, and we hope to see you back again next week for another episode of the FBC Okeechobee Podcast.